Dr. Taylor received her bachelor's and master's degrees in art history from Brigham Young University and her PhD in the history of art from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. She's taught courses on the history and theory of art, the history of creativity, interdisciplinary humanities, and on religion at BYU, UVU, and the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C. Dr. Taylor's research focuses on late antique and early Christian art, iconography, and reception history with a special interest in the artistic representation of women during this period and on female piety. She's spoken extensively and published uh, numerous articles and book chapters, many of which treat the memorialization of the dead in catacomb images, on sarcophagi, and in other media. Her fir first book is at the printing press right now, in fact. It's titled Allotting the Scarlet and the Purple, Late Antique Images of the Virgin Annunciate Spinning, and it's being published by E.J. Brill. Our speaker today uh, brings tremendous intelligence, creativity, and passion to all of her work. I always enjoy hearing her speak. I know you will, too. Today's lecture will be a treat. Please welcome with me Dr. Katherine Taylor. I want to welcome you all here today on this All Souls Day. As a predominantly LDS audience, you're probably familiar with All Hallows' Eve that we've just had, right? And perhaps even All Saints' Day. But I find today particularly poignant for this talk because All Souls' Day is the day when all the souls of the dead were traditionally honored, not just saints or popes or important elite, but all souls. These souls, especially as they are memorialized within the earliest Christian years, fascinate me. Outside the Roman city walls of the ancient city of Arles in southern France is a large necropolis, or city of the dead. You might recognize the name of this place, known provincially as Les Alice Camps. In other translations, in French, for example, it would be the Champs-Élysées. In Latin, the Elysi Campi, or in English, the Elysian Fields. The resting place of souls, heroic and virtuous. Constantine himself favored this city, and from the era of late antiquity, it became an important Christian base, with its own Catholic bishopric, and it was popular well into the fifth century. It was common for roads leading out of Roman cities to be lined with tombs, mausolea, and even martyrium churches. The Elysian fields in Arles were highly desirable places for burial, especially after St. Genesius and St. Trophimus were buried there. By the fourth century, several thousand tombs filled the necropolis and sarcophagi were stacked up to three layers deep. Dante Alighieri immortalizes the spot in Canto 9 of the Inferno, where he mentions that sepulchers are so numerous that they make the ground uneven. The cemetery here was later looted during the Renaissance, but many of the larger sarcophagi still line the lanes and are piled up around the Martyrium Church. Famous artists like Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh painted here, capturing a late 19th century autumn view of the lane lined with poplar trees. I had known about the tombs and mausolea that lined roads like the Via Appia in Rome, but it wasn't until I visited Arles that I realized how integral sarcophagi were to Christian devotion, not only for their narrative scenes and images, but as markers for the space between the worlds of the living and the dead. You see, you can even break down the word sarcophagos to sarcophagos. It means flesh eater. The sarcophagus itself is a type of hell mouth, a juncture, a fissure, a break, a gateway into the liminal space where the Holy Spirit and the spirits of the deceased were expected to abide and commune with the living. There is hardly a circumstance more prone to the potent realm of memory and the imagination than death. 
Sarcophagi and catacombs were physical reminders of the reality of death. They were the locus of lament and the site of funerary rites for the deceased. As funerary objects, they drew upon the collective memory of mourners and pilgrims and connected the world of the living to a new kind of underworld by adapting Roman commemorative programs in ways that maintain the venerable legacy of the dead. The practice of lament traditionally fell to women. Women were primary actors and the creators of ritual oral lament, especially as they were improvised. Women washed and anointed the dead and iterated the story and circumstances of death and life for the deceased. Women's storytelling may well have populated the accounts of Jesus' own miracles, especially as they concerned themes featuring women, like hospitality and burial. Women began mourning immediately following death and gathered kinswomen, mothers, sisters, daughters together. Mourners eulogized and narrated the loss of the deceased. They sang laments over the dead as an act of communion with them. The iconography of, sar of the sarcophagus may well have acted not only as a visual mnemonic for recalling the character and virtues of the deceased, but also for connecting their dead with salvation through raising the Holy Spirit. John Chrysostom, a fourth century theologian and patristic father, brings to bear this idea. Visions of death and the visage of the deceased were not far from the eyes and the imagination of early Christians. Chrysostom associated the vision of funerary, funerary piety with night vigils and specifically cites women as those watchful souls who, quote, go into the country and, quote, watch through the whole night. The countryside journey was associated with vigils specifically kept in cemeteries and at tombs. More formally, Chrysostom references the established patristic tradition of, quote, passing over the houses of prayer in the cities, so moving past churches and cities, and that the fathers had, quote, ordained that we should hold our assemblies today outside the city and here. He's underscoring the celebrations of Maundy Thursday into Good Friday with the focus on the sacrificial lamb in similitude of Christ crucified and that mass was to be held in cemetery churches because it was in the midst of all the faithful dead. Today we're going to explore in brief how biblical women were strategically represented in the world of memorial as archetypal gatekeepers. We're going to look at Rahab and her matrilineal covenant. We'll look at Susanna and woman wisdom and we will look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a virtuous creatrix. The iconographic systems associated with these women reveal their place as figures that initiate three salvific ministries. That of Joshua, that of Daniel, both close types of Christ, and that of Jesus himself. Our first gatekeeper, Rahab, in the matrilineal covenant. Rahab's story is found in Joshua 2 and 6. The narrative account has two Israelite spies entering Canaan in order to survey the land and then report to Joshua in advance of Israel vanquishing the city of Jericho. The story itself features three main scenes in which Rahab's voice is the powerful catalyst for the breach of walled boundaries, Israelite success, and the establishment of a new kingdom. Each time Rahab's voice is employed, she declares a wise strategy aligned with the Israelite agenda. First, the named harlot, yes, she is named a harlot in the Old Testament, Rahab hides the spies on the roof of her house, under a large pile of flax, and deceives the king's guard who comes searching for them. Underneath the flax, within Rahab's household, the spies are dependent on her for safety and salvation. They are at her mercy. The primary source, site, excuse me, for their deliverance is found in her household, and it depends, their safety depends on her wise cunning, her movements, her initiative, and her clever disguise. Our second example finds Rahab extracting an oath from the Israelite spies. 
that they will save her and her household when they return with their armies to destroy the city. She then helps the spies escape by lowering them from her window outside the city walls by a cord and basket. Finally, Rahab and the spies covenant together to save all within the walls of her house if she will signify it with a scarlet thread tied to her doorframe. The covenant is kept, Rahab is saved, and she is initiated into Israelite society. Rahab's story is ultimately the story of the sovereignty of Israel's God and the accounting of his interventions and deliverance in bringing Israel into the promised land. The image of Rahab is featured in Cubiculum B of the Via Lat Latina Catacombs in Rome. Discovered in 1955, the Via Latina Catacomb is a sophisticated and relatively small wonder gallery of fresco painted cubicula or rooms and galleries. The image of Rahab is located near the entrance of the catacomb as part of the vault decoration in Cubiculum B which I think you can see there at the bottom, right-hand corner. The image, um, let's see, Rahab is pictured in a trapezoidal frame. She occupies the window of her house, and is set in the, uh, which is set in the outer walls of Jericho. She leans forward and grasps the cords tied to a smaller basket with two small, child-sized Israelite spies inside. I know this is hard to see because these images are deteriorating themselves, but I hope you can make out the figures here. She appears to be partially veiled, but most of her hair is revealed, parted down the center. Her dress is only partially shown, but she appears to wear traditional Roman-style stola. There is also a fringed piece of cloth that hangs over the lower part of the fenestration. The only other decorative element is a cypress tree, common to funerary settings, framing the scene on the right side. At first glance, the image seems to be simply representative of the textual account, but it seems slightly out of place amongst all of the great patriarchs, male deliverers, Christological types, prophets, and heroes in the same chamber. Here are a few, and if you move back into the chamber just beyond Cubiculum B, you'll find a, an intricate series of images detailing Moses' extraction of the Israelites from Egypt and Joshua's deliverance of them into Canaan. I suggest that the vault image of Rahab, viewed just here as one enters the Cubiculum, seems to be an image of initiation and a connecting figure or link between the patriarchal promises made to Israel and the matriarchal strategists that physically ensured its inheritance. Why would I make that leap? Because 30 feet away is Cubiculum A. Cubiculum A, B, and C were all built and decorated, dug out and decorated at the same time, between the years about 310 and 325. In Cubiculum A, there are women, lots of them, six, <laughs> that are cited as major actors within their own narratives. These women include Eve, alongside fallen Adam, Rebecca at Isaac's meal, securing the birthright blessing for Jacob, Susanna and the elders, surrounded by the fountains of her garden, Tamar, seated and approached by her father-in-law, Judah, Job's wife, serving him bread, and Mary at the adoration of the uh, of the Magi. I suggest that the identity and sheer number of women featured in Cubiculum A, along with many of their matrilineal connections to Christ, reflect some schools of patristic thought and may indicate the influence of a female patron in suggesting the iconographic program. The proximity of these women to the vault image of Rahab in the next chamber conceptually ties the cubicula together in a way that suggests that Rahab is also one amongst their ranks of patriarchal wives and matronly virtue. This may sound surprising, considering who Rahab is, right? Joshua 2 is one of the richest narratives in the entire book. The literary elements include irony, humor, symbolism, suspense, threat, and sexual innuendo, and the triumph of an unlikely heroine. The innuendo is in her name. It's, her name is connected to her profession, and it's also connected to the expansion of the kingdom of Israel, ironically. 
Textual expressions concerning the Israelite spies who entered, came into, and spent the night or lay down or double entendre and intimate, it intimates a relationship between Rahab and the spies slash Israel. Effectually, the symbolism is fraught with sexual connection and eventually the marriage between Rahab and Salmon, according to Matthew, uh, or possibly uh, Joshua himself in the rabbinic tradition, creates the matrilineal tie to the lineage of Jesus. Despite the reader's association of Rahab, explicitly called prostitute, with sexual deviation from the holiness boundaries of Israel, she, like Tamar and Susanna from the book of Daniel, she is also a savvy character. She not only thwarts the king's guard, but negotiates an oath that will preserve her familial household. Moreover, her ability to be saved seems to hinge on her knowledge and acknowledgement of the God of Israel's sovereignty. Above all, it is Rahab's speech, her voice, that identifies her as set apart as the keeper of a particular kind of prophetic knowledge. She is the unlikely gatekeeper, establishing the success of Israel, for Joshua does not enter Canaan without Rahab. Still, one would expect the inclusion of Rahab alongside the great patriarchs and the male heroes of the Old Testament to be somewhat irregular and curious. That's because we've overlooked the iconographic visual part of the catacomb and the symbolic parallels between the images of Joshua and their relationship with Rahab, her household, the window, the binding thread, the scarlet cord in the narrative. Rahab's scarlet cord and its relation to the blood of Christ in the Passover is the subject of early patristic comment. Both Clement of Rome and Origen make a point of commenting on Rahab's ability to prophesy. Origen specifically envisions Rahab as a prophetic figure when he maintains, quote, born a pagan, Rahab was now, fully, was now full of the Holy Spirit, giving testimony to the past, faith for the present, and prophecy for the future, end quote. However, even these interpretations are relatively narrow and ignore the layered matrilineal iconographic elements associated with Rahab. Her window is established as a type of delineating border here. It becomes the symbolic element in understanding her image. If the book of Joshua is a typological account of the mysteries of Christ and Rahab is pre presented in detail at the beginning of the text, clearly she is an initiatory wisdom figure, an apotropaic protector, even a foil type for Mary, the necessary guardian at the gate. Rahab's vantage point, high at the window, in the wall, underscores her role as one who sees from an elevated position. She recognizes before her people that the God of Israel is the one true God. She anticipates and negotiates deliverance for her family in the moment of Israelite invasion and in her role as matrilineal mother to Christ himself. Even the rope used to lower the spies offers potential for deep symbolism. Noting the difference in the Hebrew words between the word for cord and the word for thread is important. The spy's deliverance by way of the cord is fraught with birth associations. It is a binding connecting cord in color associated with blood and bloodlines. Rahab's appearance at her window represents the gateway to deliverance and is symbolic of incarnation and birth. The author of the text carefully also notes the trademark element of the scarlet thread in the, in the story. We need only look back to the story of Tamar's twins by Judah to find this motif repeated in association with other births as well of, as, of course, the deliverance in Passover of the Israelites. Rahab's story is a story about a bond, a token, and a birthright covenant. Our second archetypal gatekeeper is Susanna. Susanna and the conflation of her type with woman wisdom. As the story goes, a fair Hebrew wife named Susanna was falsely accused by lecherous voyeurs. She bathes in her garden, having sent her attendants away, and two lustful elders secretly observe her. When she makes her way back to the house, they accost her, they threaten her, and they will claim that she has met a young lover in the garden unless she agrees to have relations with them. She refuses them and is brought before her community and accused of adultery. 
She is about to be put to death when she prays to God to save her, and God moves upon a young... Sorry, I'm, my students know I feel I'm a weeper. <laughs> Excuse me. Upon a young boy named Daniel to help discern the truth of Susanna's virtue in the full and capacious meaning of that word as a capable, prepared woman of strength. Susanna's story reflects the warning given to the son in Proverbs 1. You can see, if sinners entice thee, say, come away with us. Let us lay wait and lurk privily, or they want to swallow you up. Um, if their feet run to evil, make haste, move away from them, right? So, so here we have, um, in Proverbs 1, the imperative to follow after woman wisdom in the next verses rather than folly. You may not be familiar with the story of Susanna, thanks to Jerome's Bible translation, in which the first chapter in the book of Daniel becomes the last and eventually falls out of the canon altogether and is called apocryphal. I have identified six Susanna types in memorial art within the late antique world. It would be impossible to unpack them in our time given today. But while here, here are a couple in sarcophagi form, there's also uh, a fresco in the Greek chapel, the catacomb of Priscilla, and also this type um, in a catacomb at, uh, at Rome, the Pietro and Marcellinus uh, uh, catacomb. And while it is unusual on sarcophagi in particular to see multiple scenes combined in one narrative, that's exactly what we have here. The sarcophagus at Girona, Spain, exclusively focuses on the account of Susanna. In fact, this is one of the rare sarcophagi that feature a single narrative in all of late antiquity. The Girona sarcophagus features five scenes of the, in the Susanna narrative and is meant to be read from right to left. The pseudo-sarcophagus frieze is set into the wall of the sanctuary overlooking the altar in the church of St. Felix. A female figure, veiled, is in the orant position holding a book or perhaps a capsa. So I want you to start, we're going to start reading it from the right and move to the left. A capsa is like a scroll box, okay, a round one. <clears throat> Um, I lost my place. Two trees flank her, and two male figures gaze at her and perhaps gesture to her to follow them. This first scene depicts Susanna as larger in scale to her other recurring figures in the rest of the frieze. I suggest that this scene correlates well with the first incident in the Susanna narrative, but may also be read as the figure of the deceased in the guise of wise Susanna with an honorary parapetesma or cloth of honor behind her. It may also be the case that the artist recognized the need to reduce the figure size in order to accommodate the rest of the narrative in the allotted space. Or perhaps the scene was the first to be carved on an unfinished sarcophagus, with the rest of the iconography chosen later, thus dictating the reversal of reading order right to left, rather than left to right, when the patron commissioned the entire history of Susanna. This would be particularly intriguing situational evidence for someone like me, as the scene would then have been recognized as familiar to the Susanna narrative within its own historical and iconographic context. The next scene shows a more diminutive and deveiled Susanna, set within an architectural structure. Here, Susanna has been formally taken by the elders and publicly accused of adultery, Notice that she still retains the capsa or round scroll box at her feet, a clear indicator of her knowledge of the law of God. Also, two small figures, one male and one female, stand behind the elders, perhaps associated with Susanna's parents, who taught her, according to scripture, the law of the Lord in parallel to the scripture we saw about the son in Proverbs 1, 9 through 10, who was taught in the instruction of the father and the law of the mother. The story quickly evolves as the false elders are officially seated with footstools. They point and accuse her in company of her community, indicated by the multitude of figures gathered around them. Enter Daniel, whose hand is on the head of veiled Susanna, with the two elders in the background. Following the true discernment and judgment by Daniel, the two elders are driven forward to their end by a figure with a sword, 
perhaps a wingless angel of the Lord or a righteous elder, as noted by his garb, stature, and absence of military dress. Another beardless figure stands in the background of the accused elders, perhaps Daniel or another angel. Susanna's narrative is underscored by themes of law and judgment, themes that grow hazy when we only focus on the element of sexual distraction in her account. Sexual become sorry, in her account, Susanna becomes the great wise foil against which the folly of the elders is held. These themes are dependent upon understanding the inaugural typology of wisdom as present in the symbolism of Susanna and its conflation in the representation of the deceased Orant. By the fourth century, there's a significant shift in the way Susanna is discussed. The focus is less on her presentation as a victim and more on how she acts as an exemplar. Although some scholars limit her example to that of sexual propriety in the face of danger, the representations on sarcophagi would indicate other early Christian interests. Susanna, even in her garden, is shown dressed as a matron, exercising paideia, <clears throat> wearing her stola and paula with scrolls either in her hand or with a scrinium or scroll box near her feet. Educated in the law of Moses by her parents, Susanna's learned status, coupled with her beauty, create a, unite, a unique type of holy desire. Her house and household are the locus of mysteries of knowledge and of the law. The elders are in her home for a reason, right? Probably visiting with her husband, but still, this is a, an important locus. Her own words, from her beginning to her end, articulate a special knowledge of God, his mysteries and ways. Described in uh, Daniel 13, verses 3 and 14, you see here, how she, ar she articulates how she has come to know God and that God knows hidden things. Susanna takes on the guise of woman wisdom. And woman wisdom knows God because she was with him from the beginning. The pre-creation state of woman wisdom is parsed out in the poetic form of Proverbs 8. You can see here um, how woman wisdom speaks in uh, cohort with uh, Yahweh, right? The Lord begot me. I was brought forth. Before he had not made the earth, I was there, right? When he inscribed the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman. I was his delight. So there's a really close connection between the way that um, wisd woman wisdom is described here and what we're going to talk about with Susanna. Of all God's mysteries, he seems to delight in the exercise of his arm in Im the impossible situation, revealing himself to the righteous. In four short verses in the Susanna account, we see the series of events set in divine motion that ultimately result in Susanna's deliverance. Of course, Susanna will cry with a loud voice. She calls to God directly, and the Lord hears her voice. Not only does Susanna evoke wisdom in calling upon God, even if it results in death, she becomes wisdom in act and attribute. As woman, wisdom is the consort of God, even in creation, and was present with God from the beginning, he would immediately respond to her need for aid. She is his delight and companion. Even so, as Susanna exhibits the, in the guise of woman wisdom, she too calls upon God and is immediately saved. There are two genres of wisdom literature that that li wisdom literature typically follows. First is the encomium of speech or praise, and the second is the exhortatory discourse used to persuade or convince someone to a particular course of action. Interestingly enough, sarcophagi, sarcophagi can also function in these same ways, lauding the life of the deceased while also calling the living to emulation. Although woman wisdom can be read as a type of the hypostasis of God's wisdom, the fact remains that she is still formed and personified as a woman. With attention giving, given to personal and even quotidian association of her attributes with women in the real world. Clearly, woman wisdom found in Proverbs is a complex and multivalent female figure that maybe none of us can ever really hope to uh, be like in this life. She is elusive and sought after in one moment and is in, 
as intimate and familiar as a lover in the next. While wisdom is discussed as having divine status in Proverbs and other wisdom literature, she is also readily associated with the realia of women as bearer and source for material wealth, status, honor, and well-being that you find in Proverbs 31. On sarcophagi like the one at Girona, Susanna is conflated with woman wisdom and with the orant figures of the deceased. She is the embodiment of the Greek concept of sophrosine. A self she is a self-contained agent of divine action. Clement of Alexandria clearly set a precedent for Susanna's association with sophrosine when he identified her among women capable of exceptional dignity. Asterius, in homily 6.7, encouraged Women emulate Susanna in this way, you will guard your sophrosine with courage as she did hers. Susanna stands at the gate, armed with the text and the word, in the very moment in which her actions decide her fate and initiate Daniel as a prophetic figure. Our last case study, as it were, today, is Mary. In Ravenna, Adjacent to the church of San Francesco and the tomb of the exiled poet Dante Alighieri is a covered portico where we find a vaulted sarcophagus known as the Pignata Sarcophagus. This monumental tomb was meant to house and protect multiple deceased, but was also designed to be viewed by the living. It dates to no later than the fifth century. Four scenes are present on the sarcophagus. First, the presentation of the apocalyptic Christ enthroned on the front. A stag and doe drinking from a wide-necked crater on the back. Mary as the virgin annunciate spinning the scarlet and the purple for the veil of the temple on the right side short end. And a newly attributed scene of Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene um, on the left short side and end. Sorry, that was so immature. Uh, <laughs> it was very exciting, though. Um, <clears throat> This specific iconography chosen for the short ends of the sarcophagus demonstrates a tether to Mariological themes and demonstrates parody, if not pre preference, for female actors at the Christological gates of incarnation and resurrection. The Annunciation scene with Mary seated on a low stool drawing fiber robes vertically to her staff from a large woven basket is described in the second century Proto-Evangelium of James. And you can note here that she was allotted the true purple and the scarlet, um, colors that are very symbolic of, of course, blood, royalty, and things like that. We won't go into that here. Her pose is characteristically classical as she sits in profile facing the angel Gabriel. It's traditionally, this pose is also traditionally associated with representations of goddesses like Ceres and the Roman Magna Mater, or Great Mother, as well as on numismatic evidence where female members of the imperial household take seated profile or three-quarter poses demonstrating their pudicitia or their, their socially pious, modest behavior. The image of the Virgin Annunciate spinning from its earliest iconographic representation is something quite different from the transformed, hieratic, and codified type of the Virgin that becomes popular after the declaration of the councils of Ephesus in 431 and Chalcedon in 451, where Mary is proclaimed Theotokos, the God-bearer. Later, Byzantine examples will find the stylized virgin enthroned or standing clothed in imperial purple and even wearing the scarlet shoes of the Basilisa, the empress. This formal idealization of Mary inherently separated her from the ordinary matronage and purpose and, and from her ordinary matronage and purposefully created an inaccessible Marian type in accordance with ecclesiastical agendas. Be sure of that. In contrast to this later trend, the sarcophagus right and end shows the Virgin wearing a simple stola and a pala wrapped around her shoulders and draped over her head. Mary's gaze, as assumed by the placement of her face, is directed simultaneously toward her handiwork and Gabriel. The angel Gabriel faces Mary on our right, and though he does not appear to be stepping forward or advancing, his body is slightly inclined toward her. 
His right hand is raised in salutation and appears to be grasping the remaining fragment of a staff while his left hand holds his garment in front of him. Gabriel's wings are large and reach the top of his head to his knees with a span that doubles the width of his body. The angel's attire features a long tunic and toga and he's presented in three quarter pose. When we place the Annunciation scene found here on this sarcophagus next to other images that depict young women and matrons spinning, we find some thematic continuities that are adapted from the Roman world into Christian art. Images of spinning and wool working were commonly associated with wives, mothers, young women throughout antiquity and never with the ascetic renunciation of those roles. An example, um, which I'm going to skip to here, is uh, on the frieze of the Forum Transitorium, which depicts Minerva teaching young women and matrons to spin and weave, scenes which predate the earliest enunciation scenes by mere decades. Here, craft, domesticity, industriousness, civic duty are intricately connected in the character of both the goddess Minerva and the virtuous Roman matron, in high contrast to more ascetic practices. Associating the virgin with the spindle and distaff helped lend the new Christian faith credibility because those symbols were already associated with virtue and civic order. The Roman uh, mores maiorum, right, the values that were easily translatable into Christian iconography. Of course, there are um, early marked epitaphs that are very simple um, that said lanum fecit, or she worked with wool, uh, or she made, uh, made with wool, used throughout the empire as a final memorial to industrious wives and mothers. Um, but there's also a panoply, uh, or panoply, sorry, of other small domestic type objects that women owned and used, like pilgrim tokens, textiles, marriage rings, and cosmetic Pixis jars. To name only one tradition that we can look back to to draw out meaning from uh, the spinning motif, we can look to early Greek history, where spinning was used as a symbol of life force, creation, wisdom, binding, and mending. For the Greeks, fate was spun as a thread along a linear progression of time. <clears throat> According to the Greek literary tradition, the morai, or fates, were three in number. The spinner who spun out the thread of life, one who allotted or measured the span of that life, and one who cut and ended life, cut the thread and ended life. Their mother, the three fates mother, was Ananke, the great goddess of the universe, uh, alongside her consort, Kronos, who spun out the threads of time and space with the celestial bodies of the sun, moon, and planets acting as her whirls. With Ananke personifying the ordered workings of the universe and her daughters representing the continuum of life past, present, and future, it is no wonder that to wield a spindle had deep ideological, spiritual, philosophical, and practical meanings, attributes adapted by the early Christians for the mother of God. By adapting the antique trope of spinning for the virgin, the piñata sarcophagus provides early evidence that the spindle was a specific signifier of matronly virtue, associated in very quotidian ways with the very creatrix of the body of Christ in Mary. Now set within the context of Christian death and burial, the devotional side of salvation through the word made flesh was by her body. Mary, as the virgin enunciate spinning, becomes the physical virtuous creatrix, a type of gatekeeper whereby the entire Christological program is set in motion. The domestic image of Mary spinning makes a bold statement against the exclusivity of ascetic practices meant to remove spiritual life from the household and instead directly situates the emulation of holy behavior well within the reach of ordinary early Christian women. They could see themselves, like Mary, as essential to the divine economy. Because they were like her. They did the things that she did. 
In conclusion, we stand to gain much from lay piety, from art, from iconography, and from the devotional practices of early Christian women. The realm of death and memorial is poignant to this fact. This has been a very quick wade through some very deep waters. Whatever archetypal clues or symbols that we have uncovered come to us from the body of wisdom found in the late ancient world of Christian art. As an art historian, I believe that it is imperative to look carefully at the evidences of our past, to examine our heritage of faith through the lens of material culture, and to draw those things together into what Elder Maxwell called the Holy Present. The Holy Present then contains the allotted acres for our work, our discipleship, our vocation, our calling. I'm grateful that my work crosses paths with the believing dead, gatekeepers in life and death. Thank you. I am willing and able to take um, some questions here for the next few minutes. I know we want to be respectful of time and your, your time as well as others who may need this space. Um, but before I field any questions, I want to say a deep and heartfelt thanks to my colleagues at the Maxwell Institute for providing an academic home whereby these little excerpts that you've seen today have all come to publication fruition in their different forms. So I am very grateful for the friendship and the conversation partners that I've had there um, over this past year. It's been a life-changing experience. And I'm grateful it's on campus. So thank you. Okay. I'm done. Let, ask my ask your questions. Yes, London. Some I have I have seen some traces of polychromy on sarcophagi. Um, as I've looked at them up close, it's really fascinating to see these little colors in crevices and little bits of gold um, gilding on, on certain figures or in certain places. So I, I can't say definitively that they all were, but um, I, I would say that they, they were in some instances uh, painted. There was, there was polychromy. Yes, over here. Mm. Yeah, so um, it is really large. Okay, if I were to stand next to this sarcophagus, it would be, it's taller, than the, the, the cap is taller than my head, okay, the lid. Um, it is unfortunate that we do not have um, clear records as, you know, all the way back to the 5th century that might tell us who was buried here. But um, it is likely that there would be, because it's such a costly, precious, amazing object, um, it's likely that the family would use uh, the sarcophagus over and over again. You'd place the body in, sprinkle it with lime, let it deteriorate, um, and reuse it. Okay, another thing uh, relating from the way the beginning of this presentation was all those sarcophagi that were, uh, that were seen to line streets, who were buried in all of those, just so I'm Okay, so um, the burial grounds, the Champs-Élysées, right, the Elysian Fields at Arles, were in use um, in the Roman period. So, so um, and then it becomes even more popular to be buried there. Uh, some sarcophagi were brought 
to that location even by boat because people wanted to be buried next to particular saints there. So you've got really probably a mix of, of people who live in the area, Christian, non-Christian. Um, the, the sarcophagi that are still there lining the, the streets, the road, um, are in, they are weathered, shall we say. Um, but many of the best figural decorative uh, sarcophagi are preserved. There's a wonderful um, museum in Arles. Um, Mark, you, you, you're in, I, I can see your face <laughs> not even there. Uh, that preserved some of the kind of the finest examples. Okay. No, it's not. Not anymore. <laughs> um, you can go online. There are, uh, it's it's there. It's right there. It's Daniel thirteen. I think there are other. Sorry, I'm not. I'm I'm not a text person per se. But um, uh, thank you, thank you, Jason. Harper Collins Study Bible. Actually, yeah, that you're right. That's exactly where I saw it. <laughs> okay. Hmm. I um, I would defer to my biblical scholars in here. I'm, yeah, it, there there are some really. Uh, thank you for your comment. I would verify with others. Thank you. Yes, over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think it's found Daniel thirteen. It's the it's placed there, although in its, I do know enough to know that in its original um, position, it would have been chapter one. Yeah. Next question. Yes. Uh, in the introduction, you talked about the role of women uh, in death rituals. Mm -hmm. What do we know about how that evolved? I mean, is it as simplistic as women are present, are the portal, if you will, to mortal life, and so also are I think mm -hmm. um, I think that they find themselves taking up those roles. Um, we know a little bit about it within the late ancient Christian world because patristic fathers are commenting on. You kind of have to read in between the lines a little bit, right? Um, they're commenting on uh, the excessiveness of female mourners, or and so so. There's we do have a, a, a tradition uh, that that points to. Uh, women specifically in these roles. And I can point you to some additional bibliography if you're curious. Yes. Oh, um, I've been long fascinated with uh, the image of, of Mary as the virgin and nunciate spinning. That's been, uh, I think, really at in my heart of hearts, that is, that is a really special image to me. I've been working on it and with it for a long time. Um, I think it reveals a lot to us about the early devotions of, of women, um, and it reveals a lot to us about the way that women were thought of in, in those kind of more capacious roles than we tend to think that they were in the early church. Yeah. I think our time is about up. So thank you once again. We could all give. <laughs>